Welcome to the Healthy Heart Show, where we pull back the curtain on conventional medicine and dive into the root causes of cardiovascular health. If you are concerned about high cholesterol, high blood pressure, heart attacks, stroke, or atrial fibrillation, this is the place for you. We will provide natural heart information that will help you prevent, treat, and reverse any ailment, leaving pills and procedures out of the picture. Here are your guides to holistic heart health, board-certified cardiologist and Amazon best-selling author, Dr. Jack Wolfson, and natural heart doctor, naturopathic physician, Dr. Lauren Latanza. Hello, and welcome to another episode of The Healthy Heart Show. I'm your host, Dr. Lauren Latanza, naturopathic physician here at Natural Heart Doctor, where we bring expert advice from around the world to work to get everybody to their 100-year heart. We have an excellent guest for you today. We have Jeremy Scott of Jeremy Scott Fitness. Jeremy is a former collegiate athlete and cum laude graduate turned best-selling author of Make Success Mandatory and Get Lean Gluten-Free. His blog has been named one of the top 20 fitness blogs. He is a four-time cover model. Shape Magazine named him one of the 50 hottest trainers in America. He has worked in partners with some of the biggest brands in fitness, including Men's Health Magazine, Reebok, Under Armour, Vitamin Shop, Bodybuilding.com, just to name a few. He is also the host of the popular Jeremy Scott Fitness podcast and radio show, He just has a humble, no excuse and straightforward approach to mentality and fitness. And more than anything, his words of inspiration can just be applied to many arenas of life. And he's just an all around good guy. So we are so happy to have you, Jeremy. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Makes me sound uh, super important. So I'm glad to be here. Well, we are lucky to have you. And, you know, of course, start of the year, everybody kind of starts thinking on this, but we pulled thousands of our patients and email followers and you know, social media followers. And we had a lot of interest among that demographic in fitness and nutrition. So I think that this is as good a time of any to, you know, start setting some goals and know where to start. So uh, lucky for me, I know I knew just the man to call on. So we're happy to have the expert and uh, I guess let's just roll right into it. So I wanted to kind of just get our listeners kind of your just a uh, overall view about um, kind of goal setting and fitness as a whole. I mean, for the average person who is probably the, the biggest demo that we work with, it's we understand the normal adult has 800 things going on. So when us for fitness professionals say things like, well, you have to be active every day, track your macros, do all these detailed things, that probably falls on number 27 of the list of things they want to get done for the day. So I always say shallow and deep end, depending on where people are at, obviously on their journey. So if you're a person who's, you know, doing nothing, just even walking 30 minutes a day goes a long way. If you're somebody who eats, you know, garbage seven days a week, starting with one great meal or or one basic day, it's really just looking back on maybe, let's say the last two years, since we all lived through this really strange uh, era of time, and maybe you're not where you want to be at, just auditing the things that didn't work and kind of assessing where you're at today. And starting with, you know, we do long-term goals, kind of mid-range and then short goals. I'm a huge process person. So a lot of people focus on, well, I need to lose a hundred pounds. And that's awesome. The way that we kind of reverse engineer it is, well, if we lost, you know, half a pound or a pound a week, it's going to take us, you know, one, two, three, four years and so on. So what are the things like you guys can do daily that are going to add up to monthly and yearly results? So really it's just, kind of reverse engineering from there and then building the little goals into the big goals. Right. Yeah. And I like that you look at what didn't work because it's a process and it's just like medicine. It's a practice. Do X, Y, Z. If that didn't work. All right, let's try something else. And a lot of that can be through elimination or so on and so forth. If it's glaring you in the face that you drink two liters of Coca-Cola every single day, we know that that's a good place to start, but otherwise you kind of just got to navigate it for yourself. Um, well, it's just real quick. The only thing that we just kind of think is going to happen naturally, when you look at your life and most of the people who listen here probably have a career or they're a good parent or they graduated college or something, there's a specific you know set of kind of habits and rituals you follow and coursework you follow. If you're trying to save for retirement, you have these kind of metrics you follow, yet people try to transform their body and, and kind of go at it with, with no roadmap. 
which to me, it's the hardest thing you can do is to change your flesh. I mean, it's a battle you have to fight every single day because you're always getting older and softer and wrinklier. It's just, it's just happening. So you really have to audit it and manage it as you move forward. And a lot of us kind of just, we fail to do that and then think awesome things will happen. But if you looked at every other area of your life with raising kids or a career, it doesn't just happen. You're very specific with it and your body is the same way. Right. We kind of go lax on certain aspects of our life and expect that just a little bit of work is going to do the trick. Yeah. Um, and you know what? We, I, I'm sure that you find this as well in your day to day is that people will really procrastinate because they overestimate the amount of time that's necessary to really make some changes. Yeah. It's uh, the two things we say is I think if you look at obviously like the Western diet and kind of how we live our life, we're the as busiest we've obviously ever been, but we underestimate how much we eat almost to a person. Cause we forget little things that we just shove in our mouth throughout the day. And then we overestimate obviously how hard we worked or how, you know, hard we worked out. And then what most people do is they underestimate what can be done in like a year or two years, but we overestimate what can be done in like three months. And then they do something for 90 days and like, well, it didn't work like this sucks. I'm going to quit. But again, if you go back to, if you've learned how to play piano or learned how to play golf or spoken a second language, the first 90 days, you were terrible. You're completely (laughs) awful and fitness. You can make a huge dent in it in 90 days, but if you've been doing something for nine years, you're not going to fix it in three short months. It's going to take a little bit longer. Right. And I would even pair that with, so you maybe take some measurements, maybe you step on the scale, maybe you don't, that we all know that that's not the best barometer for true fitness, but if you pair that with some lab work, I, it's just amazing what you can do in six months or a year and reversing and improving your overall health. I was going to say like, if you look at your life and like the things like you're good at and, and what you guys do well, you tend to spend a lot of time and energy on it where I would say the average person doesn't get their blood work done um, even once a year, which is crazy, but they'll watch, you know, 300 hours of Netflix. And that's like, I don't want to go down a deep rabbit hole, but if you really strip it down and say, well, I'm investing so little time into my health and fitness, that's why it's not where I want it to be. And I'm not saying you have to spend 70 hours a week on it, but if you spend four hours a week on it, the ROI on that is bigger than anything else you're going to do. Absolutely. Great point. Um, so one thing, one thing that we wanted to bring up from our uh, survey was how to goal set in a sustainable way. I think that that's really important that you're not just, I'm going to work out at five 30 every morning. Maybe that's not sustainable for you. Maybe you got kids and you got to drive all over town to get them to school or this or that. So what's a good approach to a sustainable goal? The average person we see, and this is how we created a majority of the programs that we do. Obviously we have people who are super fit and they come like seven days a week. They're crazy. That's not normal. And neither, I wouldn't recommend it for the average person either. But when you look at the average adult, if we can get them, it's all time-based, right? So if you, if you really are neurotic like me and you map out every second of every day, how much time can you guys dedicate to fitness per week? So we go by the, we call it three by 52, three workouts a week, every week for 52 weeks. Typically, if they can be like 30 minute blocks, that seems to be sustainable for the average person. It doesn't have to be Monday, Wednesday, Friday. It can be any three days that work for you, but you have to kind of make that non-negotiable and carve out those times. On top of that, if you're doing anything else, meaning if you can just get 10,000 steps in or go for a walk like every single day, or even just doing 10 minutes of mobility as you watch TV or or before or after bed, that's fine. But for the average Joe, three by 52 seems to be a decent mix of where they can get enough stimulus to the muscles. I mean, they're burning enough calories, they're getting into a routine, um, but they're also not burning themselves out and they're not so sore they can't move for three weeks either. Mm -hmm. And then they don't start to resent that schedule because it is feasible. It's not, oh my gosh, I can't believe I have to do this again. I'm so sore from yesterday. So it's actually something that we can work into the schedule pretty regularly. Yeah. I look at it like how we do, like we partner with a, like a yoga studio and I think yoga is great. It's an awesome supplement, but by the time for me, I'm busy as well. I would have to drive there, do the whole yoga practice. I'm so sweaty. I'm disgusting. I can't do anything else. I have to take a shower. It's like a two hour investment of my day. So just knowing that in my head makes me not want to even attempt it. Now, if they said I could just pop in, it's 30 minutes, I'm out the door. 
it's much more sustainable for me. So I'm not just daunted by the time investment alone. That's why we keep it short. And if you really, you know, you're not BSing the workout, 30 minutes for most of you guys is more than enough. Absolutely. So kind of breaking down those barriers so that you're not going to make excuses the day of or when you're actually going to get there. For sure. Um, and, and you had mentioned mobility. So can you talk about the importance of mobility in fitness? Uh, for life in general, um, I'll go super serious and then we'll, we'll bring it back. If you mm-hmm. look at, let's say, nursing homes, uh, most of them, I think the statistic when you poll, it's about 75% of the people in nursing homes are there because they can't really use the toilet unassisted. Mm-hmm. So what does that mean in terms of fitness? That means you can't really do three-fourths of a bodyweight squat. That's your mobility. Um, along with grip strength. And now they have all the studies they look at, like in terms of grip strength and how long you're going to live. I think part of that's because if you were to fall, you grab something and it holds you up where if your grip is weak, you can't. Mobility is probably the one thing all of you guys can hold on to for, I would say, almost your entire life. Uh, When you look at the progression from people who they go from like walking to a cane to like I guess like a walker, then to a wheelchair, then to bedridden, that progression goes really fast. Like it, it's drastically quick how you go from one to the other. And so if you guys are, when we say mobility, think of it as like dynamic stretching. If you guys are familiar with like inchworms or Spider-Man steps, or just even doing toe touches, hanging from a pull-up bar, really basic functional things, how you get up and off the floor that you have to do. Um, I would say if you, if nothing else, if you dedicated five to 10 minutes a day to that, a, it's going to cut down on the risk of you having like what we call non-contact injuries. Like if, if your husband tackles you, nothing you can do. You're going to fall. You're gonna hurt. Um, but from you falling downstairs, slipping, maybe catching yourself if something goes wrong, that's where mobility is going to help you guys kind of get through everything. And it allows you to just have a better quality of life. Because if you think about it, if you can't walk and you can't move, your quality of life goes down drastically. Um, I think it's everything. And if you are someone who is relatively fit, It allows you to get into bigger ranges of motion. You can do all different types of exercises. You build more muscle, you lose more fat. Everybody wins. It's kind of the one thing that is kind of the key to your entire fitness, whether you're young or old. Awesome. I think that, like I said, I mean, really just, you can apply it to so many avenues of life. And you think about, you know, maybe you have an elder, if you're not elderly yourself, you think about your parents or your grandparents or somebody that you don't want them on their own unless they can do these certain things. So yeah, when you get into a nursing home, you have to have assistance for just about everything because you don't have that quick maneuverability to be able to catch yourself or um, even just having balance alone is just so important to overall health and improving your lifespan. Well, and as, as everybody gets older, these things just get harder. Uh, It's not, if you look at a a 12 year old kid, a lot of them can almost do the splits. They can touch their toes. They can, we get people who come in, they're 42. They move like they're 92. And if you think that that's going to naturally just get better and easier as you get older without working through it, you're crazy. So you really just have to dedicate the time now. And it's never too late. It doesn't matter if you're 55 and you're not super flexible, like you can become more mobile. Now you might not become way faster at running or be able to dunk a basketball when you're 60 years old, I go, but you can still become more mobile and have a better quality of life. So I do think that's probably the most important thing people are not doing day to day. Absolutely. So, you know, if people are listening to this, like, okay, I'm not mobile, I'm not fit. What's a good way to find and stick to a fitness routine that maybe that they don't even know where to start. Do I start just go by going and bench pressing? Do I, where do they start? Like if you have no clue, um, I would just say if you can get a coach um, and be in a community, I think it's, it's key. Um, I'm not trying to sell anybody at anything. Like I have no problem with the big box gyms, right? Like they're great. But the way that I look at those, it'd be like if I went to my dentist office, but there's no dentist there and they said, Jeremy, do your exam and clean your teeth. Like I know enough, like I can floss and brush, but beyond that, like I'm an idiot. I don't know what the heck I'm doing. A big box gym is kind of the same way for the novice person, meaning you're going to, you're going to walk in, you're basically just renting equipment from them because there's no instruction and there's no program design. So you're going to gravitate towards like two or three movements that, you know, and avoiding all these things or imbalances you have in the body. So I know it's an investment, but it's an investment in yourself. And I think it'll, you'll build the foundation of skills that you can have for the rest of your life. So I do think 
having a coach or somebody guide you um, to walk you through it is, is probably the best place to start. Obviously, like we put out so much free content, but there's no accountability behind that. People can kind of turn it on and off when they want. If you look at the best athletes in the world, the Michael Jordans, the Charles Barkleys, when you take them out of sports, um, they don't look the same anymore. I'll put it politely. <laughs> um, their habits change, right? Because there's no goal, there's no accountability, and there's no coach. And so if you can have those three things, you're going to be way better off. And I think the money you spend on it, it's a way bigger ROI than if you're just going to, you know, pay 10 bucks a month, walk in a room and blindly try to find it on your own. So that's the key. And then once you learn the skills, you guys own them and then you can, you can play with them as you like. Yeah. So you're, you're paying for a skill set. So goal accountability and having a coach to get you there and do that ideally without getting injured. Yeah. And uh, if you don't know anything, I mean, literally just walk every day. It's, mm -hmm. it's one of the biggest things. And then just do the basic stuff, you know, as a kid, like if you can do body weight squats, if you can do push ups, if you can do toe touches and jumping jacks, just moving your body through space is probably the greatest thing anybody can do in terms of overall medicine. We say movement is medicine. So the more you move and just move in dynamic ways, like even just walking backwards, walking sideways, these really small things we take for granted that we used to do as kids. Now we don't. If you just resort back to that, that alone is, is going to put you guys in a better position. Yeah. I think walking is such an underappreciated form of movement because people will come in here and they're like, oh, I don't really exercise. You know, I, I walk, you know, 30 minutes a day. I'm like, that's significant. For sure. You know, sitting is the new smoking. So that 30 minutes away from, you know, your couch is excellent. So if you're, and I'll, I'll kind of double down on that. So if you're already doing that, find a hill, walk up a hill instead. So I wanted to ask about if you maybe, so you definitely this accountability piece. So if you get somewhere and then they are expecting you, you have that accountability, but what if at home, you don't have a strong support system that's really encouraging you to show up and be that person every single day that you're working towards? Uh, get divorced for sure. <laughs> um, I'm kidding. Uh, don't do that. Uh, we, we've done the podcast on this. Like, uh, I think we call it like eating healthy, uh, despite your partner, mm -hmm. you know, you're not gonna, you can't change, uh, the people around you. Like there's, you're not going to change them instantly. Um, it's tough. You have to be, I guess the person that they, they follow. And what I mean is if you're dedicated to being healthy, you can obviously you can have an open conversation with them. I don't know your relationship. I mean, it might go well, it might not. People are adverse to change, especially when you're saying, hey, eat this and don't eat this and I'm going to do this. All you can do is you have to do what's best for you. We always say, like, put your mask on first. If you can do it long enough, the person you're with is going to gravitate towards you. They are not going to pull you down. You're going because here's the thing. Being fit and healthy is like the it's the coolest thing ever. It, to me, it's it's better than being rich. I mean, it, you can invest money, you can get rich. That's fine. But a lot of rich people can't get fit. Being fit is the new, like, you know, that's the status symbol in my opinion. And there's not a person you meet on the street. You could walk up to and be like, Hey, you know, we could give you, you know, this amazing, powerful body. That's like, you know, you look great. You're lean, you're ripped, you have abs. No one's going to turn it down. Everybody wants it. So you're, you're presenting them something that is hard to do, but it's something that ultimately I'm sure they want to do deep down. Um, all I would say is if you were you're with someone, you can lead by example and you just keep banging on your drum. If they're doing things that are holding you back, all you can do is politely ask them, like if chocolate's your thing or wine's your thing, like, Hey, can you just not keep it in the house or maybe not do it around me and just have some kind of healthy boundaries? Cause at the end of the day, like you're trying to do something that's better for them. It's not, it's not detrimental. And I know that's tough, uh, for a lot of people. And the ones we see that are the most successful, if you're just willing to die, like on that hill, you just draw the line in the sand and be like, you know what, I'm going to get in as many fights and arguments as I need to in order to be healthier. Eventually, you're going to win. It's a painful process. I, I've lived through it with a lot of couples, but uh, eventually they'll they'll come around. The Healthy Heart Show will be right back after we take this quick break to hear from our sponsor. Would you like to drink great tasting coffee that's also good for your heart health? Cardiology Coffee is your answer. This five-star rated coffee is delicious. It's a gourmet coffee that begins with whole organic beans, hand-selected, and carefully roasted. It's tested and certified to be free of pesticides, mold, and other toxins. Cardiology coffee is great for your heart, and you're going to love how it tastes. Order now online at cardiologycoffee.com. Now back to the Healthy Heart Show. 
That's really great advice. You know, you can be somebody to pull the other up rather than being supported. So I like that. Um, what about, so let's kind of talk about the fuel source now. So we kind of talked a little bit about goal setting and consistency, um, but now maybe the foods. So what is your approach to nutrition? So before we kind of dive into it, let's just hear uh, your thoughts on nutrition as a whole. Yeah, uh, it's the, I mean, eating right is the hardest thing uh, most people will do in their life just uh outside of like you know if you're fighting in a war or battling cancer like these are obviously anomalies but in your day-to-day -day life it's because eating right it's we're not teaching people the the skill of eating they know a baby can do it you grab food you put in your mouth we're trying to change a behavior pattern mm -hmm. and you're in a world now where you can buy five thousand calories for five bucks there's all these amazing restaurants uh food is an experience i'm not against that but it's, we're inundated by it all the time. So what I'm saying is you have to win the decision of eating right two, three, four times a day, every day, or however many times you eat. And it's hard to, to always come out with a W. I'm a fan of eating real food. Obviously, I think when most people eat real food, we tend to self-regulate. And what that means is if you're going to eat apples, odds are you've never eaten 10 apples in a row. But if you look at Oreo cookies, you guys are probably eating a whole sleeve at once or Girl Scout cookies or, or cinnamon rolls, whatever your thing is. We tend to do better when the food is in its you know, most real form, I guess, if that makes sense. And then inside of that, there's a million different protocols that work for everybody. You know, some people like fasting is their thing. Some people it's a keto or paleo or gluten free, whatever your jam is. Those are just, you know, little niches inside of that. But they're all based in the same principles, real food. Mm -hmm. And that's what we coach everybody. If you want to go deeper, obviously you can count macros and micros, and then there's deficits and surpluses. But at the end of the day, if, if you guys snapped a picture of what you're eating and most of it, you know, runs, it flies, it swims, you know, it grows from the earth, you're going to be okay. If it's all in a bag or a box and it's highly processed, it's just, those are engineered to make you want to overeat and you get this like habit forming addiction to those where I don't think you get that with asparagus compared to like Doritos or something. Right. Definitely. Yeah. If it's got a label, you're kind of just completely un, un, out of control about what's actually in it and what you're putting into your body. So it's a total guessing game. So that's why I usually tell patients, if, if you can look at it and tell what it is, you're probably a little bit safer. And like you said, you're probably not going to overeat it because the chemical structures of it are naturally occurring and it's not just going to hit your body and just kind of be this bottomless pit where you get to the bottom of the bag and whoops. Um, yeah, we don't uh, we don't overeat on asparagus. Like I've never met anybody where that's their problem. And I know people will rag on fruit like, well, fruit has sugar in it. I've never met a person who's come in and said, hey, I'm 400 pounds because I ate too many bananas. Like that, <laughs> that, that wasn't the thing, you guys. So just if you keep it real, you'll be OK. Yeah, definitely. Um, what so what are your thoughts on fueling for workouts or like post-workout meals? Do you think that we, is breakfast the most important meal of the day in your mind? What, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, I mean, I might differ from a lot of people. I don't think uh, the timing uh, is that important for a lot of folks. Uh, for some people, it's personality type, right? Um, we're all a little bit different. Uh, I don't eat breakfast personally. That works for me. I haven't in probably like 15 years, give or take. I wake up super early. Um, I just don't, it doesn't, I don't feel good when I do it. It feels like it's the last thing that I need. And I'll wake up at four o'clock in the morning. Some of you guys who are a little bit later, maybe it's fine, but I look at it as I laid in bed all night. I didn't really create a demand for the food. Now your body might be different. Uh, I'm just, if it's pre-workout, post-workout, again, it depends on the individual. If you really, you know, crushed it and you feel like the body is depleted, uh, there's a lot of recommendations we give. If it's like a one-to-one -one ratio of proteins and carbohydrates, meaning, if you look at like, if we're talking hypertrophy, how you build muscles, you can get real complex. But if you ate like, let's say 30 grams of protein, it may be 30 grams of carbohydrates. For some people that tends to be like a, a kind of an even mix. Cause obviously now the carbohydrates can show the protein to your muscles. They can help them repair, re replace any glycogen you lost. You have more energy. That's fine. For most people, we tell them in our coaching groups and we walk them through like how to eat. If you can kind of commit to a, a routine in the schedule, I think it's, it sounds like that is you're trapped in it, but it really there's a lot of freedom in that. So if you eat two times a day or three times a day and at about these times, and you're going to get a routine that works for you. Um, do I always eat right after a workout? No. Sometimes it's like maybe an hour later, 
but that works for me. And it always comes back to, you just have to audit your lifestyle and what works for you and what you feel is best. Cause a lot of people say, well, my friend does this and that's great, but odds are they have different parents. Maybe their age range training was real. They grew up doing something different than you. Their body type is different, their hormones, who names it. So you can take pieces from what everybody else does, but ultimately this is where you guys actually have to do the work and find out what works best. And you just play with it. And it's, it doesn't happen in a week. It's going to evolve as you evolve and your goals do. And as your body does. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. And, you know, we kind of touched on a little bit about like food timing. Um, and also I think that that's like a really heavy hitting piece in the fitness and nutrition, but also, you know, this idea of macros and some people might have a, be very well versed in it and be completely understood on it, but maybe others are not. So what, what can you kind of just give us an, an intro to macros for those that don't know? Yeah. Like when you guys hear the term, um, and it, now it's becoming more popular, like in our world, it was, this has been forever. Uh, I spoke at a group, I think it was like at and It was like their uh, diamond star people. It was like a hundred and some people in the room. And I'm like, who here knows what macros are like three hands go up. Mm-hmm. And so then we do a talk like we do with 10 year olds. Cause that's where we're at. So when you hear the term macros just means macronutrients. Those are the big three for most people, your proteins, carbs, and your fats for the day. Uh, if you want to say alcohol is like the, you know, fourth like stepchild, I guess, if you want to really put it in, because alcohol obviously is not free um, of it, but proteins, carbs, and fats are the big ones. And when you guys look at your overall calorie intake for the day, and then, you know, everything is not equal, Um, you know, calories in, calories out, there's a difference. And the example we give is if you're going to eat, let's say 2000 calories a day of all Sour Patch Kids, and then 2000 calories a day of like chicken, broccoli, bananas, like real food broken down in these you know, proteins, carbs, fats to make up that 2000, you might weigh the same at the end of three months as the other person. But in terms of how you look, your body composition, how you feel and your energy and output are going to be completely different because the macro breakdown was different. Instead of having to be all generic sugar, you have a mix here. And that's what we talk about with people. You have to have a blend that works again for you. So if you're doing something for performance, Like you're going to do an Ironman, you're going to ride a bike a hundred miles. You're going to swim for two miles. You're going to run a marathon. Your carbohydrate intake is probably going to be higher because it's the easiest energy source for the body. And if you're someone who just wants to look good and your workouts are maybe 30, 40 minutes, your carbohydrate intake will probably be less overall. um, Just because you don't need as much to feel what you're doing. And that goes into a, a calorie count too. And if they say micros, like your micronutrients, just the vitamins and minerals that kind of make up everything else that goes into the body. That's the, the dumbed down version for sure. Love it. Awesome. So calories are not created equal. Look what your, look what your goal is. What are you fueling for? What do you want your body composition to look like? Love it. Okay. Um, so, uh, how much time would you say that people would need to dedicate for food and for pairing that with, um, some exercise, how, what would be a, a good estimate of like, okay, I'm feeling better. I'm feeling healthier what's a good like time estimate? Uh, Like in terms of results? Yeah. You know, for obviously if you are, you know, 600 pounds doing anything better, it's probably going to, things are going to change really fast. Uh, If you're already relatively fit, it's going to take a lot longer. The cool thing is, is if you're already at a certain level of fitness, the fitter you get, the harder it becomes to make changes, especially when you start to get like super lean or super strong. But the nice thing is, is your body is so efficient. It's like compound interest. You know, the rich kind of get richer in terms of that. For a lot of people, we tend to say, you know, after maybe like eight to 12 weeks, um, you're going to start to feel like this drastic change in your body. You might not look like a different human, but you'll definitely be more mobile. You'll be stronger. Um, your digestion, the way you process food, um, how synthesis works, everything is going to be more efficient. Mm-hmm. Probably, you know, six months in, you're going to have a lot of friends and family, like really start to notice, like, you know, you're looking different, moving different, feeling different. And I know people don't like this, but like in a legit year, it's like undeniable, um, for most people who really put the time in and we live in this, you know, kind of microwave, uh, world, but really it's more like a crock pot. And that's kind of how you have to look at it. Like you're just putting the stuff in and you're letting it work over time. And if this is a lifestyle change, you know, what, what is really a year, if you're really going to be a, a different human overall, like there's nothing else you can really do in that quick of a time frame. But honestly, if you're doing something like 90 days, like three months in legit, and honestly, we have a program where it's like 50 days and it's really immersive. Now, these are people who kind of 
you know, give up a lot of the old habits and they really jump in. So like anything in life, the more output you put in, um, typically the quicker, you know, things tend to be. And if you're, it's more a gradual change, that's fine too. I urge people to do whatever's easiest for a lifestyle change. So meaning like, well, I'm going to give up drinking and I'm not going to do anything for three months. I go, that's cool. But at the end of the three months, how much of it is really sustainable? So I'd rather have you guys take nine months, do it the right way. So it doesn't feel like you're, you know, killing yourself and giving up everything. At least that way you can have this. And now it's a lifestyle. So now it's just something you do. You don't feel like you're, you know, in a diet or you're like in a program. It just becomes who you are and what you do. Right. An overall lifestyle change, overhaul, what have you. Yeah. And I know you guys do the um, 47 day challenge. Is that right? 47 days? Yeah. 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 Um, so why did you choose 47 days and kind of how does that go for the people that sign up for that? Um, you know, for us, it's, and we've done this for a long time. Now there's maybe one or two programs we do that are longer, but for a lot of people, a, it's obviously we run a business, so, um, you gotta be able to sell it. I can't sell a 10 year program. Um, even though it's really what it is, uh, it's just, it's hard to people buy into. So it's, it's a long enough time where people can commit to something, um, and also see the results from the efforts that they put in. If we do something that's way shorter, uh, they tend not to elicit as big of a change as we want them to see. And it, all the things we want them to learn, it takes us about seven weeks to really like drill it in uh, to their head as they go. And it gives them a carrot, like an external motivator. And we say this throughout the program. It's not just about making the biggest change in 47 days, although a lot of people do. And like we do prizes for it because we kind of game it to make it fun. Obviously, we're adults. We all like money and free stuff. But it's can we teach you over the course of basically two months and you hear me say the same thing, you know, 800 times where it becomes part of what you do. So now you, you learn these skills in 47 days that you can hopefully take with you for the next maybe, you know, 47 months. And so we dig down on um, eating type. We dig down on macros. Obviously, they're in a program where mobility is included. All the workouts come to them. It's basically just laid out um, as it, simple, stupid as possible. We do a huge like personal development piece in there just for the fact of these are habits we have. We all have bad habits and it's not just with our eating and drinking, it's it's with a lot of things. But if you really do, if you looked at any personal development course you've ever taken, we take a lot of the popular pieces and have it strip it down. And you'd be surprised if you look at your life, like how, you know, finance and, and fitness and your eating habits, drinking habits, sleeping habits, they really correlate close to one another. So we try to just get people to do the hard work. And once we have them in the ecosystem, they're kind of forced to do it. So it works pretty well. Awesome. I think that's a great approach. A good, like you said, People are, okay, 47 days, I can deal with that. 10 years, I don't know. But you in, equip them with the tools to get to that because it's a mindset shift and all of that. Um, so like I mentioned, we, you know, working in cardiology, we have a lot of patients that are somewhat hesitant to get started with exercise and some of these major changes in their life. So sort of my advice to them is to, you know, check in with your body, listen to your body. What are some advice pieces that you might have? Because I know that you train all age groups, you know, it's not just 18 year old kids that are collegiate athletes that can do anything. You have all ages come to you and look to advice. So maybe some of the, um, some of these middle-aged patients and older that are somewhat hesitant, like how, how do you sort of guide them to be safe, uh, and exercise? Yeah. I think the oldest person we have is 70, maybe 74, 75, I think, uh, you know, I, I may be different than some people. Like I can say whatever I want. There's no rules uh, in my world. And I don't, and I'm not saying I don't care about hurt people's feelings, but I'm not the tell you it's okay if it's not okay person. And the way that we phrase it to these guys, I'm like, well, you're never going to have more time in your life than you do right now. Mm -hmm. Like tomorrow you have one day less, you know, with, this is running out for all of us. And the longer you put it off, the harder it becomes. And if you want a visual, I look at it as like, you're standing in a, in a one foot hole. If you're not really happy with where you're at, but you're still fit, you look good, whatever. If you're not mobile um, and you don't feel good, you're like in a 10 foot hole. It's way harder to get out. And every day you wait, you're just kind of sinking into that quicksand over and over. And we coach a program where if you come in, like how we do our stuff, and this is how most good fitness professionals do it, you can get people who are super fit and they can go crazy. So you give them the keys of the car and they floor it. When someone else comes in, it's like they have training wheels on. So we just regress any exercise that's needed. So they can do anything. 
Um, you just, you have, that's why I say a coach does help because they can find your starting point. If you're like, well, my knees are bothering me or it's a hip or a shoulder, there's no one exercise you have to do. So anybody tells you that they're wrong. You don't have to do this kind of squat. There's 50 different squats we can do to elicit the same result. If you have wrist issues, there's a million wrist placements we can do. So you can do push-ups, and so you can get off the floor, mm -hmm. um, but you have to start doing something. You really do. And it's again, shallow and deep end. We're not going to throw you in the ocean and you'll drown. We'll put, you know, some floaties on you and we'll kind of walk you through it in the shallow end. But the key is just starting. Um, it really is with even the most basic stuff. And that's what we tell everybody. And we, we find something that works for them and they kind of go at their own speed. And you'd be surprised how far they can come in six, a 60 year old. Honestly, now it's so crazy. We have dudes like, I forget how old people, I'm getting old. So I start to forget how old people are um, in our, we have the Sunday group, which is like a bunch of killers, like it's the hardest workouts of all time. A lot of these dudes are like 55 years old. And I met them probably when they're in their early forties, they look the best they've ever looked mm -hmm. where I think a hundred years ago, at 55, you're basically dead. You know, you just, you get diarrhea and you die. We don't have medicine, different things like that. But now you look at 55 year olds and they're just, they're shredded. They yeah. look great. So it's not too late. It really is. No matter if you're 19 or you're, you know, 75, you have the rest of your life to really just kind of, you know, grab these skills back. Right. You know, workouts are scalable and age is totally relative. And this is very pop culture, but I saw something that the golden girls are the same age as the new sex in the city that just came out. So they portrayed them as these old women, like That's crazy gray hair. And now it's sex in the city characters and they're cast and they're just skipping around New York city. So age is just a number start, get started now so that you're not looking back like, man, 55 was super young. And I feel like I'm walking around like I'm hundred years old. So get started now. Agree. All excellent advice. Um, so a question that I ask all of our guests is how do you live a heart healthy lifestyle? Um, I mean, I live it every day. I'm i I'm a practitioner obviously of what I do. I don't just, I'm not, uh, obviously we run a business now and things are, are way different in my world than when I started, but I didn't start this to make money. I didn't start this to like, have it be a career. I just really, um, I, well, I sucked at everything else. So there's that. <laughs> And I didn't, I didn't uh, want to hate my life. So fitness is what I do. Um, it'll always be part of my life. I was an athlete forever. Um, I've never not been active. There's never been a time where I didn't train and I didn't move around. And the older I get, and maybe when you're younger, um, and this is why we probably see the older people tend to be fitter, because you're doing it not just for vanity reasons. Um, you're doing it for like these internal health reasons. So I do everything from the inside out mm -hmm. and the byproduct is, and you just start to look and move a different way. So it's everything that I consume and it's obviously the foods that I eat. Um, you know, I don't do drugs. I don't drink alcohol. I don't do all these detrimental things unless my wife forces me to have a drink and obviously, um, I'll bend, but I try to be really mindful um, of everything I consume. And when I say that it's not just the food I eat and what I drink and the supplements I take, it's the things I watch, um, the things I listen to, the people I surround myself with, and the amount of stress that I'm willing to take on in my life. And then I know um, as a business, we could probably make you know half a million dollars more per year if I was willing to maybe work out less myself and do certain things that were just for money, but that would cause me a lot of stress. And for me, it's not worth it. When I look at overall stress of your life, like all of that affects the heart. It's not just what we eat and what we drink. So I try to do things that just, you know, if I know if I mentally don't feel good, it's going to tax the rest of my system. So I'm very, uh, I put boundaries up uh, in terms of like, I don't watch the news. I don't do things that make me feel crappy. Mm -hmm. um, and that goes for what you eat and with everything else. So that's probably the biggest thing I would tell anybody is just, if you're doing something and you're not feeling good about it, just stop for a second, step back from your life and kind of audit it and say, hey, you know what? When I watch this, I don't feel good. When I read that, it makes me feel weird. When I hang out with these people, I don't get the best vibe. All of that affects your body, um, whether you realize it or not on an internal level. And I think that all comes down to, to your brain and your heart for sure. Absolutely. We digest more than just our food and we have to kind of detox our environment. If it's crappy food or crappy people, we got to get away from them and kind of learn what's best for us. And, you know, these, these different practices that you can learn and you can accumulate over time, they will make dramatic shifts in your life. So I would say, you know, just getting started as soon as possible. I talk to patients all day, every day. They're like, you know what? I got off once I started this exercise regimen and started listening to, you know, what was good for me and 
you know, listening to my body and feeling like, you know what, I thought I could digest this and I, I had to cut out dairy ultimately or whatever that might be for you. But then they got off of their cholesterol medication. Then they got off of their high blood pressure medication. So all of these things, you can start to detox your, you know, your medication shelves as well. So keeping, keeping it simple, keeping a whole foods, things that are good for you, things that make you feel good, all good stuff. Great advice. Well, Jeremy, thank you so much. Tell our listeners where they can learn more about you and um, how they can continue to get inspiration from you daily. Uh, yeah, we put out uh, a lot, uh, a lot of stuff. I think more than almost uh, anybody. Uh, all my stuff's at, at Jeremy Scott Fitness. So obviously we have a website, Jeremy Scott Fitness. All the social media handles, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, it's Jeremy Scott Fitness. It's the Jeremy Scott Fitness podcast. Um, we have a newsletter that comes out at least three times a week, every week. We've done that for 13 years. We do two podcast episodes a week. I think the YouTube has 1,500 videos. They're all free um, if you guys want them. And if you have a question, uh, you can message us. Uh, I reply to all of them eventually. Obviously, now there's a lot more people uh, than there used to be. Um, but we get back to everyone. And I promise you, if you guys have a question on anything that's like, you know, baseline health and fitness related, we've already podcasted it, we've written about it, and we've done a blog on it. So I'm happy to send you uh, the information uh, if it can help. That's so awesome. Having that education out for the listeners, you do provide some excellent, excellent advice, excellent insight. So I would definitely hop on, give him a follow on all avenues, get his emails, you know, all, all of the different things that will help support you in making these lasting changes in your life, in your body, and in your goals as a 100 year heart, you can get there. Um, you just got to hold yourself accountable. Well, thank you for an awesome episode. We loved having you on here today, Jeremy. You all, we will be back with a, another episode next week. Have a great day. That does it for today's episode. Thanks so much for listening to The Healthy Heart Show. Please help us get the word out by liking and subscribing to our podcast and our Facebook page, Natural Heart Doctor. Please show support for our podcast sponsor, Cardiology Coffee your resource for organic, antioxidant-rich, mold and pesticide-free coffee shipped straight to your door. Learn more by adding at Cardiology Coffee on Instagram and visiting cardiologycoffee.com. This podcast provides materials for information and educational purposes only and should not be considered medical advice. We encourage you to contact your physician for any of the health issues discussed here.